Good afternoon. Uh, we have Ellen Goodwin here. She's going to be. Uh, she's been. Uh, she's given a TED talk, which is awesome. So this should be really good. Ellen Goodwin is a productivity expert and trainer who inspires digital entrepreneurs to cut the BS, turbocharge their results, and become the action hero of their business and life. As a former graphic designer, she's well acquainted with the perils we all face when trying to get things done when we'd rather be doing something else. Please welcome Ellen Goodwin. What is the difference between a superhero and an action hero? Superheroes are tights, they've got capes, they have masks. They fight interesting people. They have superpowers. They have a whole conference dedicated to them over the convention center in July. Action heroes, on the other hand, are just mere mortals who have learned to leverage the forces of action, energy, and focus to overcome obstacles, to vanquish their foes, and to achieve their goals. None of us can be superheroes, but every single one of us can be an action hero of our own life. And that's what we're going to go through in the next 40 minutes. So, who am I to tell you how to be an action hero? I'm Ellen Gibbon. I'm a productivity expert, I'm a trainer, and a full-time action hero. I was a graphic designer for 20 years, and that's pretty much why I'm an action hero, because that put me there, and I'll explain that in a minute. I'm the founder of The Shift, Accountability, Ma Accountability Mastermind, co-host, of the Faster, Easier, Better podcast, and oddly enough, the co-founder of the Dive Bar of the Month Club here in San Diego. So, I was a graphic designer for 20 years, and about seven years before the end, I fell into the pit of procrastination. And whether it was just because I was bored or my clients didn't inspire me, I started missing deadlines. I started not doing what I was supposed to do. And any of you that have clients, you know how much clients love it when you miss deadlines, right? They don't, they hate it. So clients weren't happy, I procrastinated more, I lost clients, I almost lost the business, which is when I did a nice talk with myself saying, what the hell are you doing? And that's when I did a deep dive into procrastination, where it comes from, how we can get rid of it, and it all comes from our brain. And I'll go into that in a little more in a, just a little while. But it all comes from our brain. So through deep education, training, research, I put together tools and systems that I started to use that brought me back from the brink. My clients, my friends, my family saw what was going on. They asked me to help them. That's when I became an action hero. So today we're going to learn how you guys can be action heroes. Again, it's that trifecta, action, energy, and focus. Those are the three things that are going to make you an action hero. So action. Action is the number one thing that we need to do. Now, I'd like someone to yell out and feel free, who is your favorite motion hero? That's perfect. There's no such thing as a motion hero. There's action heroes. People get confused between motion and action. And it's not just people, it's your brain. Your brain cannot tell the difference between motion and action. It sees motion as you having done something. Whoa, look at me, I did something. Motion is a little hamster on a wheel, going around and around and around. Action is moving forward, like a football game. Motion, a rocking chair. There's a lot of motion going on, but you're not getting anywhere. You have to know the difference between motion and action and move yourself past that. Now, motion's super important. For any of the, is there any web developers in here, would you start a website without doing some planning, thinking about the architecture, where you want to go? This guy says yes. <laughs> just go for it. Oh, just go for it. No. Uh, blogger, is it a 
time if there's any bloggers, writers in here. Would you just start? No, you have some planning. Planning is motion, and planning is essential, right? You have to plan. But here's the thing. You can get stuck in that motion, in that planning, and never move forward. Let's say I wanted to start working out. I'm going to get in shape. So I go online and I find all these exercises. I find an eating plan. I have all this stuff. Wow. Look at what I did. I didn't do squat. I need to do squats, but I didn't do squat. All I did was plan. I was in motion. Action is me getting on the floor, doing some push-ups, doing something to work those muscles. Do so you see the difference between motion and action? We need motion. You do need motion. You need motion of writing a to-do list in the morning or writing it the night before, which is actually better. You need to do that. You need to plan the website. You need to plan stuff, but you also have to move from motion into action. And the best way to do that is what I call a line in the sand. And that means you schedule when the motion stops. You have to stop the motion. So, let's say I have a project. Whoa, that's a move. Here's your line in the sand. You have a project that I has to be done on Friday. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plan noon on Monday, all motion stops. Everything else is going to be action. You've got something that has to be do it, done at the end of the day? Give yourself half an hour of motion, or an hour if you need that. You don't get your first cup of coffee till the motion stops. Figure out a line in the sand when you go from motion into action. Okay? Now, all action heroes have enemies. What do you think is the enemy of action? Procrastination. Exactly. Procrastination is the definite enemy of action. So here's our quick, gosh, this is going. So quick little biology lesson. Procrastination begins and ends in the brain. Your limbic system, which is right at the top of your spinal column, it's your midbrain. You've got some really fun things there. You've got your fight or flight response there. You've got your emotional center there. You've got your reward center. All of those work together to keep you from getting your stuff done. That's the part of your brain that wants the new shiny things, that is all excited when you get a new notification on your phone or something comes up on your computer that there's an email, all of which you should turn off when you go back to the office on Monday. But that's the part of the brain that wants that new shiny stuff. Fighting your limbic system is your prefrontal cortex. And that's at the front of your brain, and that's the most recent part of your brain to be developed. The limbic system is millions of years old. It's the old part of your brain. So, limbic system fighting the prefrontal <coughs> cortex. So everything we're going to go through is the, how we're going to overcome the limbic system, or we work with it. So, we have four types of procrastination that we all deal with. Okay, I'm not sure why I'm going to have any issues here. There we go. Four types of procrastination that we deal with. We've got... Low value, low priority. We've got fear-based procrastination, fear of success, fear of failure. We've got distractions, what I like to call shiny squirrels. And we've got procrastination when things are way too far down the road. So let's look at each one of those. So the first, low value, low priority procrastination. This is stuff that, ugh, it's not super exciting, but it's got to be done, and we don't want to do it. Cleaning, organizing, that all falls under it. I'm sure you guys can think of it. So yell something out that you think is low priority, that you don't get to. Taxes. <laughs> Taxes are a great example. If we have time at the end, I'll tell you how I did them this year, because they are low priority. So when you've got low priority, low value, What's going on is your limbic system has just named those things. It's just said, taxes are boring. Cleaning is yucky. It's emotional. So what you have to do is remove the emotion. Those tasks aren't icky. They're not yucky. They're not boring. They just are a thing. You've labeled it. 
So the limbic system gets to say no. So the best thing to do is to externalize whatever it is you need to do and set a timer. You just set a timer for what you're going to work on, for how long you're going to work. I talked to somebody yesterday, and he's like, well, I wouldn't start. And I'm like, well, set a timer for the start then. But set a timer to tell you how long you're going to do that. You just set, like, 30 minutes. I'm going to work on my taxes for 30 minutes. That's it. Your limbic system can't argue with that. It's just an externalized thing. Even better is if you set the timer for a shorter amount of time than you think it's going to take. Because that way, whether you have an artificial deadline, you don't fall into Parkinson's law. And Parkinson's law says that a task expands to fill the time available for it. So if you give yourself an hour, you're going to take an hour, even if it only takes 15 minutes. So set that timer for a little bit shorter, externalize it, get it outside of you, do that low value, low, value, low priority procrastination. Okay, the second type, fear-based. Fear-based procrastination. We all fall victim to this. Fear of success, which surprises people. Fear of failure. Fear of getting out of your comfort zone. Fear of not knowing what comes next. I listened to Roy in here yesterday talking about Gutenberg and how people are like, oh, I don't want to do that. So, fear-based procrastination. I'm sure you can all think of something you put off because you're afraid of it. So when we run into fear-based procrastination, what we need to do is pretend to be a baby. So, we all know babies, watching them start to learn to walk, right? They're kind of toddling or tottering around, they fall down, they get up, they fall down, they get up. They look like they just came out of the bar at two o'clock. They're just everywhere. But never <coughs> in the history of the whole world has one of those little babies fallen down and said, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> I am good. I am not getting up. I'm fine. You just see me here. I'm just fine. Now that baby got up and they kept going. They kept trying. You know what they were taking? Baby steps. Where do you think the name comes from? Baby steps. They were taking that. That's what we do with fear-based procrastination. We need to break down whatever it is you're afraid of. Whatever that task is. Break it down into small, little bits, baby steps, and succeed on each step. Your brain sees this big project. It sees taxes. Oh my God, what a pain in my ass. It's going to take forever. But if you break it down to small, little bits, it's much, much easier. This year with my taxes, I scheduled 10 days out, and I gave myself 15 minutes a day. That was it, 15 minutes. The first day, all I did was print out the tax planner. Woohoo! I succeeded. My brain was happy. I was happy. The next day, I did the next thing and the next day. So when you have fear-based procrastination, whoa, you're all distracted by that. Whoa. <laughs> when you have fear-based fear procrastination, act like a baby. Don't fall down. Just keep taking those baby steps. So the third type of procrastination is distractions. Distractions, shiny squirrels. We have distractions everywhere. Everywhere. We're on our phones, our tablets, our computers, our coworkers, our friends, our family, everything. The brain likes to get distracted. The brain loves to get distracted. It loves these new, bright, shiny things. So while I could tell you, oh, here, you can put this blocker on your phone, and really you should have your phone in the other room, and turn off your computer, the best way that you can overcome procrast or distraction, when it's procrastination because of distractions, is become accountable. You become accountable. Now today is Sunday. Let's all pretend that on Tuesday morning at 8 o'clock, you're getting on an airplane and flying to mid-Africa. Random place, but you're going there. Between now, or 4 o'clock when this talk's over, between then and 8 in the morning on Tuesday, you've got a lot to get done. You've got to pack. You've got to talk to the dog sitter. You've got to get make sure all the work is taken care of. There's a lot of things. 
There's no time for you to sit down and watch 27 episodes on Netflix, right? That plane is holding you accountable to getting your stuff done. And that's what you need in real life. Not an airplane, but you need someone or something to hold you accountable. An accountability partner, an accountability buddy, an accountability mastermind. Somebody that knows what you're supposed to be doing so you get your stuff done. Okay? Everybody's like that. Who can be your accountability partner? You can have a friend. You can have a neighbor. You can have a coworker. You cannot have a spouse or a family member. There's too much baggage that goes with that. You can join a mastermind group. You can, you know, have a friend that you just text and you go, hey, I'm going to do this and I'm going to text you in an hour and it will be done. Find a way to hold yourself accountable. That way you don't fall into that pit of procrastination where you're like, oh yeah, I'm on Netflix. Now, you can take this even further if you want. And you can do what I like to call putting your money where your mouth is. This works great on projects that are going to take a while. It might be 10 days, two weeks, a month. It's easy to procrastinate on those. So what you're going to do is, again, you have your task. You know when it's supposed to be done. So you've got your deadline, your task. You pick someone that's going to be your accountability partner. In my case, I always pick my neighbor. Next, I pick an amount of money I'm willing to give up if I don't get my project done. And it has to be something starting at e easily 100 bucks. It's got to be like 10 bucks. It's got to be 100 or more. Now, here's the part that's important. You are going to pick an organization, a charity, a political party, a religious group that you don't believe in. Yes, you don't get your stuff done. That accountability partner takes your money and gives it to the group that you have decided you don't like and they are holding you accountable. I worked with an author earlier this year who had three chapters left on her book. So she put 500 bucks up against herself getting it done. And if the money, if she didn't finish, the money was going to the NRA. <laughs> and another woman right now who's working on a book, she's got $1,500 up against her finishing. And if she doesn't finish, it goes to the KKK. Oh, wow. <laughs> she's going to get that book done. She is going to get that book done. So this is very extreme accountability. But sometimes we need that. So put your money where your mouth is. Finally, we have things that are too far down the road. Too far down the road. I want to lose 20 pounds. I want to go back to school. I, I want to write a book. All big things. But what happens is we can't see ourselves down the road. We all fall victim to what is known as hyperbolic discounting. And it's a cognitive bias that says... Basically, the farther we are away from the present day, the harder it is for us to understand ourselves or to do good things for ourselves. This is why when you're on a diet and someone brings donuts in, you're like, I'm going to have a donut. I'll work out twice as hard tomorrow. It never works. <coughs> we can't see ourselves. That's why if I offered you a dollar today or two dollars next Sunday, you take the dollar today. You can't see yourself down the road. So we procrastinate. Okay, so when we've got this you know, hyperbolic discounting we're, looking, we're dealing with, the best thing we can do is keep it in our present day. Because remember, we can't see ourselves far away, but we can see ourselves in the present. So the best way to do that is to chart it down in some way. Maybe it's taking a calendar and putting a check mark every time you do what you're supposed to do. Maybe it's grabbing an app that allows you to keep track of things. There's thousands of those out there. You want to mark it down. Just figure out what works best for you. Don't make it difficult. Just make it so you see yourself every day. Maybe it's a chart on your fridge that you get a check mark when you eat well. Friends of mine had a big, big project that they needed to keep in the present day, and that was that they had huge credit card debt. Now, Credit card debt is really hard to keep in the present bias, present day. Because what, you pull out the bill, you pull out the bill once a month, three times a month, and you've got three, three credit cards. So what they did is they made a chart. 
And the chart started with a really big number up here. Really big number. And a zero at the end. And they plotted out how much money they were going to pay each month and how much it would go down and go down and go down. So they had an idea of how long it was going to take. Then they took this chart and they put it on the living room wall. So they got to see it every single day. So did their friends if they happened to stop by. So for the first three months, they just dutifully paid the amount of money, just paid it down, paid it down. But they started seeing this, you know, this is on the wall every day. So they started thinking about it. So they started not going out for coffee as much, saving money on lunches, saving money so that they could pay it down faster. And they did, because they saw it every day. They finished up six months ahead of schedule. Then they turned around and made a new chart. And that chart started with zero and ended with a really big number. And they saved to buy a house. They made it happen because it was right in front of them. They kept it in their present day bias. So that's what you need to do when things are too far down the road. So action. Remember, you have to move from motion into action. Know what type of procrastination you're dealing with and conquer it in its special ways. Okay, energy. Energy. Action heroes need energy. And there's two types of energy that we're going to look at. We're going to look at physical energy and mental energy because they're both very, very important. So the first type, personal energy. Biological prime time. That's what Chris Bailey, he's another productivity expert, that's what he calls it. It's your chronobiology. How many of you in here are morning people, larks, as it were? How many of you here are night owls? <laughs> I'm not surprised. How many are in between? Because, yeah, people are in between. Yeah. Well, congratulations. No one is better than anyone else. It's just what your energy level is. Now, I know a study came out this week saying that, that night owls are going to die earlier. Don't listen to them. So we all have different energy levels. And the important thing is not whether you are a lark or, or a night owl. It's how you leverage that energy. Now, I get up at 5 in the morning, and that's when I write and I read. And everything I do is so easy because that's when I've got my creative energy. For years, I would go to the gym first thing in the morning. And then I realized, wow, I'm wasting all this good creative time. I can go to the gym later. I don't need to be creative at the gym. But now I know to take that morning time to get my work done. And it's, like I said, it's like butter. Cutting through butter because I have that creative energy. This is my best time. I can do meetings. I can do emails. I can do all of that stuff later in the day when I am not so full of creative energy. So, it's important for all of us to know when our best energy is. And the easiest way to do that is to start charting it down. Super easy way to do this. Take your phone. Take your phone, set up timers every hour for the time that you're awake. Don't do it at night or it'll screw everything up. But set a timer for every 60 minutes for three days. When that alarm goes off, Chart your energy level. Just you can put it on a note card, you can put it in your phone, just put it somewhere. It can be as simple as, you know, go from 10 to 1. 10. Oh my God, I'm on complete fire. 1. I'm napping. Don't bother me. Do this for three days. You'll get a good idea of where your energy rolls. So, are you super energetic then? Get your work done. Do the most valuable work then. When you've got lower energy, do the things that don't need as much energy, that aren't so important. So you want to leverage your personal energy. Use, think of it, how you can make your work feel like you're cutting through butter. So the other part of our energy is our willpower, our self-control. It's our mental energy. And it's essential that we conserve it in order to get stuff done, to be the best we can be. So, willpower, studies have told us, lots of studies, I'm sure you've heard of studies where we only have a certain amount of willpower, self-control at any given time. 
So we need to conserve it, like I said. Anytime we have to make decisions, we start to use up that willpower. Every decision means another little bit of willpower gets used up. We run into decision fatigue. I'm sure all of you have sat through a meeting in the morning where you're biting your tongue, trying not to talk to people that are saying things you don't agree with. You're trying to reserve your judgment, and when you get out of that meeting, it's lunchtime, and you know, you are gonna eat really healthy, but boy, you've got no self-control now. I'm just gonna have a hamburger and fries, I'm so frustrated. That is decision fatigue. So we want to guard against decision fatigue. We want to guard against our self-control, our willpower being depleted. The best way to do that is with habits. Now I know some people think, oh, habits. But you know what? Habits are just systems. They are just systems for all of us. They're a system that we use to conserve willpower. We use systems in our work, right? You start a website. You've got a system that you do. You start a blog post. You've got a system that you do. Habits are just systems that we, need, we use. So, how do you do better habits? Super easy, super easy, two super easy ways to build better habits. First, we're gonna do habit stacking. And habit stacking is basically just anchoring a new habit on an old habit. So let's say I wanted to state, start taking more vitamins. I could anchor that habit onto my morning habit of brushing my teeth. Super easy. I have a client that, just because it is tax time, realized that she should have a better system of tracking expenses because it's been a really bad month that she's been trying to get all those together. So, we're having her track expenses at the end of the day when she does her regular shutdown. She has a shutdown system, put it on top of there. Just take five minutes, track expenses. So you pick a habit that you already have. Yeah, that is your anchor. Take whatever new habit you want and put it on top of that. It's going to be a lot easier than trying to remember things. So you use what you have already, anchor it, put a new one on top. The next one is micro habits. Micro habits are when you take something that you want to add into your life and then you reduce all of the friction. You get it to the point where there's no resistance, there's no friction. Going back to the whole idea of, hey, I'm going to get back in shape. Maybe I'd say, hey, I'm gonna do 20 push-ups every day. I got some resistance to that. Definitely, I can't lie, I got some resistance. So, with a micro habit, I'm going to make it smaller and smaller. I'm going to get the part where there's no resistance whatsoever, and that could be something as small as one push-up. I'm going to do one push-up a day. The definition of a microhabit is that it is so small that you would be embarrassed to tell your friends what you're doing. So if someone came up to me and said, hey, I heard you get in shape. I'd be, yeah, I'm doing one push-up a day. <laughs> hey, me. So small. But that's a microhabit. With a woman with expenses, she could be tracking one expense a day. That's it. But micro habits have a little bit of magic to them, and that is that they expand. After you get used to doing one push-up for a while, hey, you're down there already, why not two? Then three, then five, then eventually you're at the 20. You don't have any resistance that you have to deal with. So you make your micro habits super small, so then eventually it expands and you get to where you want to be. You just remove all of the resistance to it. So build habits to keep your willpower and your self-control. Know your personal levels of energy and leverage your day with those as best you can. Because I know some people work for other people, but use it as much as you can. Leverage it. All right, now we're on to focus. Whoa, we're not? Now we are. Focus. <laughs> Well, I wasn't focusing. Focus, well, if action heroes could have a superpower, focus would be that superpower. Because when you focus, really deeply focus, you can actually expand your time. You're not being distracted. You're laser focused on what you need to do. And I'm going to show you some techniques for focusing. But just know that you don't need to focus for eight hours a day, no matter what anyone said, because your poor brain would explode. 
If you can put in a good half an hour focus session once a day, then expand it out over weeks to the point where you get two hours, seriously, two hours of really good deep focus, it's going to change your life. Focus is amazing. So, who knows what the enemy of focus is? Distractions. Distractions? We can get more specific. Multitasking, yes. <laughs> Multitasking, context shifting. Multitasking is definitely the villain when it comes to focus. So, we have to overcome multitasking. And, and yes, we can go back to the distractions, find a way to block them out. But what we want to know and what we want to do when we're focusing is we want to keep our brain in one room. So just keep your brain in one room. So imagine your, your whole brain is a house. All right? Now, I'm sure this has happened to at least one of you because otherwise it would be really embarrassing because it's happened to me. You're on your phone, whether you've you know, got your phone up here, you've got your earbuds in, and you start reading an email, maybe scrolling through your phone. Same time, you're supposed to be talking to someone. And after a little while, you're not quite sure what they said or what you read. Has this happened to anybody? It's not just me. Come on, show of hands. Okay. All right. So, if your brain was a house, this is what was going on. Every time you were reading, you were in the living room, which is the part of your brain where you can read. And every time you were talking or listening, you were over in the bedroom. Okay, that's the part of the brain where you can read and listen. Now, you can't do both things in one room. If you want to read, I mean, if you want to read or listen, you have to be in the proper room. So, I'm reading, I want to talk, I have to go physically into the bedroom. And if I want to listen, I sit there. And if I want to talk again, I mean, read again, I go into the living room. I can read in the living room, I can talk in the bedroom, but I can't do both in the same room. This is exactly what happens when you focus. You have to pick one room to keep your brain in. Because each time you go back and forth, you're using up a little energy, you're using up a little time. It doesn't help for your energy, you're losing self-control, you're not focusing. So you want to keep yourself in one room. All right, that's how we focus. So the best way to focus is with timing. Find a way to time yourself. And really, this is like my favorite timer, right there. So time yourself. You can use a kitchen timer. You can use the timer on your stove. Use the timer on your phone. It doesn't matter. But what you have to do is you're going to do it with a sting. And that's not the singer. It's an acronym that you use for whatever timing mechanism you do. If you do Pomodoros, if you do one of the ones I showed you in a little bit, as long as you're setting a timer, do this. You're going to do a sting, which means select one thing to do. You're going to keep your brain in one room. Time yourself. Set a timer, whether it's 25 minutes with a five minute break, 40 minutes with a five minute break, 10 minutes, set a timer. Ignore everything. Everything gets ignored except for what you're working on. No breaks. No breaks till that timer goes off. Then give yourself a reward. Whether it's a little bit of food, a little dance party, whatever. If you need to jump back and do it again, then do it. So I mentioned you've got uh, Pomodoro, which a lot of people know, which is just 25 minutes on, five off. It's named after a timer that looks like a tomato. You can just call it a timing method. Pomodoro just sounds more fun. Another one which is my favorite is the 10 plus 2 times 5, which is not a math equation. It's a timing device for focus. You work for 10 minutes, take a 2-minute break, you do this 5 times in an hour, you've knocked out 50 minutes of good focus with a 10-minute break. This works great for things that you want to just do in short bursts. Um, I'll do, like, I'll do doing blog posts. So I'll just spend the first 10 minutes knocking out ideas. The next 10 minutes, I might write down three ideas, three sentences for each one. The next one, I might 
Bring it out even more. You don't have to do cereal like that. You could just be doing, I'm doing 10 minutes, take a break. 10 minutes, take a break. It works really well if you have a list of what you want to accomplish. So that way, you know, if you get halfway through one of your 10 minutes, you don't waste five minutes figuring out what you're going to do. I use a seconds pro for a timing or interval timer, both of them freebies. That way I can just set up the timing, 10, 10 minutes, two minutes, set it up for five times. That way I never touch my phone because the bells go off and it tells me when things are. Because if I touch the phone and have to re you know, reschedule the timer, too tempting. Too tempting. So you want to make sure you just jump in and you go. Batching. Batching is another way that we can keep our brain in one room. So batching means that you do, you set your timer and you do like-minded things. So maybe I'm setting a timer for 30 minutes and all I'm doing is reading. But I might read some blog posts, I might read some emails, I might do some research. I'm keeping my brain in the reading room. I might do financials. You know, I'm doing invoices, I'm reconciling bills. All I'm doing is financial stuff, but I'm keeping my brain in one room. John Lee Dumas, who does the Entrepreneur on Fire podcast, he puts out a new podcast every day, and he does extreme batching. On the first Monday and Tuesday of every month, all he schedules is interviews. 15 interviews Monday, 15 interviews Tuesday, that's all he does. He stays in the same brain room, gets it all done, he's got 28 days to do other things. That's pretty extreme. Okay, that is focus. Focus is keeping our brain in the same room. It expands time. It makes us an action hero. When we put these three things together, action, energy, focus, we become the action heroes of our own life. But here's something that I didn't tell you. When we talk about overcoming obstacles and achieving our goals, it sounds like, wow, I'm an action hero, I'm going to have to work really hard. I'm going to be better, I'm going to get a lot more done. Nobody wants to get a lot more done. Nobody wants to, oh, yeah, I'm going to get more done in my day. What we all want and what you get when you're an action hero is that you are able to get your have-tos done more efficiently and effectively so you can get to your want-tos more easily. Who doesn't want to spend some time with their family, spend some time with their friends, spend some time not working? That's what you get to do when you're an action hero. You get your things done more efficiently, more effectively, you're a happier person, and who doesn't want to be able to tell each other, tell friends that you're an action hero? Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. I do. I do check out my habits. Well, I look to see if they're serving me because it's really easy to fall into like, oh yeah, this is uh, this is what I do, but I need to look at it and go, you know, what am I getting out of it? How is it helping me? Is there another way that would be better? And what I would try, and if, if that's the case, I would go, you know what? Let me try for two weeks. Let me try this because nothing's written in stone. You can always change things. Yes? Uh, procrastination. So, and selecting someone as your, um, what did you call that? Accountability partner. That word, accountability partner. <laughs> so you said, like, you have your neighbor. My neighbor does, like, for my long ones. I actually have a accountability partner that we've been partners for seven years and we've never met in real life. Um, we, he lives in New York. We talk every morning. We met in a coaching program. Uh, you know, there was a, you know, a, a message board, basically, where people were looking for accountability partners, and that's how we, we got together. So, um, you know, finding someone that you, that's not gonna make you feel bad, that's why I always say family is just a really bad choice. Uh, 
Is that your husband next to you? Because he had a question in the last. <laughs> Yeah, I've heard. Um, so you don't want family. You don't want family. You want someone that is, is going to be firm enough to say, hey, you know, why did you get that done? And maybe what can you do to do it better? The Sometimes just when you have a short thing to do, it's really easy to, to just hit a friend up and go, hey, text them. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need this done. I need to do this. And so check in on me in an hour. And I have to tell you whether I got it done or not. So, you know, friends, coworkers, coworkers are good because they're not as close, unless you're really friendly with your coworkers. So, um, yeah, there's all sorts of people. Well, you know, I guess that, like, to me, I'm like, well, you want, I want, I want somebody that was, like, at the center, and I don't mean this in any snotty little way or anything like that. But somebody that's at the same level that I'm at, with the yeah, same intention, that's not like playing a game, but they like know what I mean and where I'm going with it and what I'm trying to accomplish. That might be like an accountability mastermind because you tend to find people that are more or less at the same level. And usually if you find like a paid one, because people have money in the game and they're usually you know on the same level, you can look around, you just you know Google masterminds. And you can find one that's going to be. You can get super specific. Or develop your own mastermind. Or develop your own mastermind. But you can, you know, you can find it. Uh, here, there's a WordPress accountability group. You know, our mastermind. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. What else can I answer for people? Yes. What's that timer called that goes off? Uh, uh, seconds Pro. Seconds Pro. Or intervals. And the great thing with those is you can set them up as boxing rounds, which is kind of fun. So uh, when it starts, you get a, a ding, 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 like a round starting. And then when it ends, you got more bells. So, you know, it's entertaining. What else can I answer? Yes? How often are you talking, or however you communicate to New York, to that accountability partner? Um, every, every weekday at 8.30. So once a day? Once a day, we talk. We talk about, yeah, for like 15 minutes, talk about what we're going to do, what we did, what we didn't get done, what we're kind of hoping to do. We sometimes just bounce ideas off of each other. So yeah, 15 minutes, just like that. Sort of like a big business. In the morning, they have their meeting, and they say what they're all going to do, so there's sort of accountability for each other. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. I did yes. Design. <laughs> Not too much. Not to, you know, I enjoy it. The nice thing is I can use all of it for my own business now. So and I'm super surprised no one's asked about the dive bar thing. Oh, <laughs> star bar. Please tell me. Star bar. I so wanted to ask about it. Mean, star. How many here are in San Diego? I live in San Diego. Fantastic. Um, you can find us on a meetup. We've got the dive bar on Facebook. Uh, our next meeting is next Saturday at noon at the Turf Club. So um, normally it's the fourth Wednesday of the month and we go to different dive bars. I've done it for eight years. Um, if you get a chance, I did a TEDx talk about how dive bars can change your life. <laughs> Other people talk about, hey, we're bringing water to the Sahara and I'm like, we're going to dive bars. So <laughs> any other questions? Yes? Oh, for the 10 to 5 method, uh -huh. um, that for like one big task that you break up into uh, those bursts? That can work That can work perfectly. Yeah. I, I like to do it when I'm writing and not necessarily do the outlining, but I like it because I know that 10 minutes isn't very long. So if I'm, especially if I'm feeling like, whoa, I've got short attention span, 10 minutes I can easily walk through. Sometimes 25 minutes sounds like, oh, I don't want to sit here that long. So I do 10 minutes and I get up and walk around Sit back down, do 10 minutes. Yeah. It's, it's my favorite way to do stuff. Yes? Um, have you tried that with ADD people? I have. I have. Yeah, it's a great way for them because, yeah, ADHD, ADD, yeah, super fast. Children, too? Children love it, especially when you go for bells. Yeah. <laughs> you have to make it fun. You have to make it fun. But 10 minutes is wonderful for kids. You know, again, you're just working with that limbic system. You're, you're telling your limbic system, nope, you don't have to work that long. Ten minutes, 
We're done. We're out. Well, you got to do another 10 minutes, but just that, 10 minutes at a time. Anyone else? Well, thank you, everyone, for being here. It's been a pleasure.